Emergency Operations Center activated for the second time. President Granger proclaims March 2 as the date for general and regional elections. And a ministerial team met with residents in various communities in the Upper Takatu, Upper Essequibo region last weekend. This is Info Hub Recap. Stay with us for the next half an hour as we take you through major stories covered during the week of September 28th to October 4th. The future of Guyana has never looked better. Our nation is on the cusp of a development program like never seen before. While Guyana is now emerging as an energy giant through the discovery of massive reserves of oil and natural gas, it is your government's intention that the huge benefits emerging from this will go where it matters most, to you, the people of this beloved country. There is a surge of confidence in the way Guyana is governed once again, and the level of investor interest is unprecedented. Guyana is poised to become the breadbasket of the region, and the pace at which this nation will grow through prudent fiscal management will be nothing short of impressive. But more than anything else will be the way every Guyanese, regardless of color, class, or creed, becomes a part of this historic period of national transformation, sharing in the wealth and well-being of it all as one Guyana. Thanks for joining us. This week saw the proclamations for general and regional elections being issued by His Excellency President David Granger, stating that holding of general and regional elections will be on Monday, March 2, 2020. The proclamation was made in keeping with Article 61 of the Constitution of Guyana, while the election date was proclaimed under Article 62 of the same Constitution. Article 61 states that an election of members of the National Assembly under Article 62 shall be held on such day within three months after every dissolution of Parliament as the President shall appoint by proclamation. The head of state has also set March 2, 2020 as the date for elections of members of the regional democratic councils. Article 73.2 of the Constitution states elections of members of regional democratic councils shall be held and the councils shall be dissolved at such times as subject to paragraph 3, the president may appoint by proclamation. President Granger, on September 25, addressed the nation, announcing that after discussions with Chairman of the Elections Commission and with his cabinet, the earliest possible date for the holding of general and regional elections will be on Monday, March 2, 2020. In other news, government activated a 24-hour National Emergency Operations Center earlier in the week due to a breach of the sea defense which led to flooding in some vulnerable regions where emergency works are still being carried out. This is the second time since its formation in 2015 that the Emergency Operations Center has been operationalized. It was activated due to a breach of the sea defense which resulted in flooding. The situation has affected approximately 400 households across 65 coastal communities over a stretch of 148 kilometers. Responding to the situation on Tuesday, stakeholders from various agencies apprised the major of the damage caused by floodwaters. The agencies also revealed the steps that are being taken to prevent a similar incident as the next spring tide is expected on Saturday, October 26. Minister of Public Infrastructure, the Honorable David Patterson, indicated that keen attention is being paid to a particular stretch of sea defense in Danzig on the east coast of the Marara. He noted that this specific area is where the ministry has undertaken corrective works. Since early on in the year, um, due to the, the, well, the weather, weather and patterns and those things, we, the area land access to this particular area um, was compromised. So therefore, we were actually doing interventions from March of 2019. The urgent press conference initially heard from the Ministry of the Presidency's Director General, Joseph Harmon. He noted that a considerable amount of money has already been spent on the area and an application will be made to secure additional monies via the contingency fund to continue interventions. The monies, he noted, will only be requested once all of the ministries and agencies complete assessments, since it will cover interventions at all levels. These will cater not only to infrastructure and emergency works needed to bring much needed relief to citizens who are affected, but also to health, and among others. We want to be very clear and to be very sure that what we're asking for has to do with this emergency. So that, you know, as in previous years when people 
use emergencies to do all sorts of different things. We are very precise about what it is that we're doing. And so at the lef level of the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, at the level of the Ministry of Social Protection, the level of the Ministry of the Communities, at the level of the Ministry of uh, Public Security, Public Health, and the Civil Defense Commission, that there are people who are actually working now to see what um, is necessary to approach the Ministry of Finance. Taking into consideration the current situation of the spring tide, the fact that climate change is occurring and will continue in this century and beyond, and the fact that the majority of the affected areas are low-lying, Minister Patterson spoke of what is needed in the future to prevent similar occurrences. One, we have to build climate resilient infrastructure. And obviously the long-term situation is to anticipate how much higher this wave actions would be in say another 20, 30 years and build our infrastructure to be able to withstand that. The medium term issue, well, the short term is to close the beach. The medium term issues is to construct a full riprap structure um, along those, that entire stretch. Of course, um, that is an expensive undertaking. The opposition and civil society members will be briefed on the efforts, flood impacts, and updated on the situation as it unfolds. The Civil Defense Commission and the ministerial teams are spearheading relief efforts in the affected areas. Works on a sea defense breach at Maikoni, which was exacerbated by the spring tides, continue. Residents in low-lying and riverine areas are advised to take the necessary precautions during the next spring tide on Saturday, October 26, and to heed advice provided by the CDC in preparations ahead of that expected tide. Paul McAdam for InfoHub. Minister of State, the Honorable Dawn Hastings Williams, along with officials from the Civil Defense Commission, visited several Region 3 communities that were affected by the abnormal spring tides over the last weekend. We've been distributing some drinking waters to the families that are affected. We have already distributed some cleaning supplies. Some families were in relief and we will continue. We're now looking at procuring some food items, getting some food items because, of course, they will need some food items to maintain their families. The minister assured that the government stands ready to assist residents affected by the spring tides. One resident who lost all her chicken feed to the flood waters will benefit from a personal donation from the minister to sustain her livestock. Another resident recounted his experience and spoke about the successful relief efforts led by government. It didn't last for days, it lasts for like about three hours. In the afternoon, the overtopping came like about within half hour, the water was out again. It's a very, very um, humane act for them to come and visit us in this kind of situation. I mean, when you're in problems, people don't want to come, right? But um, they were very, very brisk. While normal high tide is about 2.8 to 3 meters, anything above 3 meters is exceptional and usually shows during spring tides. According to the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, there have been no major breaches of the country's sea and river defenses. Maikoni is the only exception since the earthen embankment is already vulnerable and has ongoing riprap sea defense works. Neighborhoods along the coast of regions 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 have been affected by the recent spring tides. The Public Health Ministry has issued an advisory. Here are a few precautionary measures to take. Stay out of the flood waters to avoid contracting diseases. Use protective gear such as long boots, gloves, and eye protection. Wash feet before entering the house with a foot bath of half cup of bleach to one bucket of water. Apply Vaseline or oil to your skin. Sleep on the mosquito nets and use mosquito repellents and coils. Ensure all water and food storage containers are covered. Use treated water for drinking, cooking, brushing your teeth, making ice, and beverages. To treat water, add half teaspoon chlorine bleach to five gallons bucket of water. Cover and let water stand for 30 minutes before using, or by boiling clean water for at least five minutes. Keep food supplies away from flood water. Wash all fruits and vegetables with treated water before use. Cook food thoroughly. Earlier today, the Sinko Limited handed over over 45 cases of antibacterial items to the Civil Defense Commission as part of its corporate social responsibility that will be distributed to the affected communities. The spring tide period will end on Wednesday, October 2nd. Stay tuned to the Department of Public Information for updates. Shaquille Bourne, Foreign for Hub. 
CDC officials also distributed much-needed supplies to residents of Den Amstel and Anna Katrina, who were returning their homes to normalcy. Minister of Communities, the Honorable Ronald Bulkin, was also part of the team that visited that area. Minister Bulkan interacted with several residents who recounted what occurred when they woke up on Saturday morning to rapidly rising seawater in their homes, schools and businesses. One of the most affected was an early childhood centre located in the compound of the Ebenezer Church in Denamstel. According to Reverend Austin, this is the first time the area has experienced such severe flooding. The floor, teaching aids and toys were damaged as a result of the salt water inundation. When I came to assess what was happening, I saw that, you know, the entire place was underwater. And this is the first time that we have had this amount of water in the compound, in the church building, in the school as well. And so the damages is quite a lot because um, most of the stuff, because of, it, because of the place, most of the things are stored flat at the level of the children. And so all the ties, all the stuff ties, especially those um, are damaged. Minister Bolkan promised that his ministry will collaborate with the Neighborhood Democratic Council to ensure that classes are resumed at the school at the earliest possible time. I've advised the pastor to compile a list of the damages and to give it to the NDC chair and um, we'll, the ministry will, will, we will see what support and I'm sure we can offer some support to replace uh, some of the teaching aids and um, toys that have been damaged and probably we'll try to see if we can assist with some of the rehabilitation works. During the visit, the community's minister and members of the Civil Defense Commission distributed a quantity of cleaning detergent and food hampers to the residents. He commended the NDCs for playing their part in the process of ensuring support is given to those affected. Uh, residents have commended the presence and the work done by the NDC, the chair and councillors. And it's heartening for us to see that this campaign uh, for the restoration of local government in Guyana and for the revitalization and rehabilitation of functionality within local government organs, that it is taking root, albeit in um, varying degrees. Sinika Thorne, InfoHub. In its response to the overtopping of the sea and river defenses caused by the spring tide, the CDC has also been working alongside other agencies to perform its disaster management responsibilities. What we're doing right now too is actually mapping using geographic information system all of the areas that were actually impacted to get an understanding of how the high tide is impacting the coastline. At present, the private sector has also collaborated with the Commission to aid some of the severely impacted communities. On Tuesday, a check valued $1 million was handed over by a representative from Chung's Global Enterprise to the CDC to assist in its relief efforts. This gesture is timely to provide food supplies that can last a family of five for about two weeks to three weeks and really able to distribute that. Uh, we are expediting this process. As a matter of fact, this check would be cash immediately to purchase food supply to be distributed by 1600 hours this afternoon. Um, starting in the community of Zilok, West Coast Demerara. Food supplies will be directed to persons in need in the worst hit areas. Here at the Civil Defense Commission, cleaning supplies are currently being loaded in a truck to be taken to some of the affected communities. Spring tide began on September 26th and will conclude on October 2nd. Shaquille Bourne, for InfoHub. With nearly 50,000 tons of boulders required to execute emergency works in the Danzing to Fairfield zone affected by unusually high spring tides on Thursday, Minister of Public Infrastructure, the Honorable David Patterson, visited the site to get a first-hand account of the works. Here in Prospect, Minister Patterson tells us about what is being done to protect the Maikoni area from being inundated with water. I met with the contractors this morning, some of them this morning, and they are to give me by tomorrow morning what equipment they have um, available, 
what stone they have available in their stockyards at the moment and, um, and how they see it, it, their opinion on, on the easiest, fastest way to get our materials in here. The minister made these comments on Thursday, October 3, during his follow-up visit to inspect the emergency works conducted at Danzig to Fairfield area. Prior to his visit, he met with four stone suppliers and five contractors at his ministry. It is the primary focus of the ministry to ensure the works carried out on the breached area are of high standard as preparations are also being put in place for the next expected high tide. The next high tide is October 26th, so we're maximizing the, um, the time we have. As long as there's no rain, we should be able to, be, to at least get to all the breaches and, and do some intervention. Um, we, while we may not be able to stop the overtopping because, you know, see, we have to get the seawalls at that, about that height where what's, what you can see behind us. And you can see how low it is here. You can see the water's already coming and the high tide is not even on. So, but we may not be able to stop the overtopping um, by the 26th, but we want to stop the water coming in free access. About 50 meters away is one of the barges that is now being resurfaced after sinking due to the ferocious tide. Currently, one of the breaches is inaccessible. To arrest this situation, numerous excavators are extracting mud from the Bellamy Canal to build a wall behind the existing boulders along the foreshore. This is needed to facilitate the traffic of equipment and materials to the sites that were breached. Within the impacted zone, two pumps are being installed to drain water from the Bellamy Canal that runs parallel to the earthen embankment and the Atlantic Ocean. More pumps will be placed in the coming days. Before leaving Maikoni, Minister Patterson met with some of the affected residents to update them on the ministry's priorities moving forward, and they expressed their optimism. Hard for everything that you've said, we have our confidence in you, and we're going to stay and I strong. Not, and I will not miss this. Thank you very much. Shaquille Bourne, Foreign for Hub. Towards the end of the week, the CDC dispatched a team to conduct assessments of the affected areas in Wakenham and Leg One. The CDC group was deployed on Thursday, October 3, to conduct a preliminary assessment on the islands of Wakenham and Leg One. CDC Operations Officer Lieutenant Lakshman Prasad was updated on the situation by the chairman of the Wakenham Neighborhood Democratic Council, Sheikh Ahmad. It was relayed that while several communities were affected by the unprecedented spring tides, there was no major impact on the island's agricultural lands. The farmlands, some of them are being flooded, but um, they, are not, they have not reported any major losses, major losses. so far. Okay. This, he explained, was due to the irrigation systems which were put in place. And because of our um, good drainage system that Wakanam has with in conjunction with the National Drain and Irrigation Board for the last 12 to 14 years, these waters will normally run into the main trench, which would take them off as soon as the tide is off. But you would have water on the lands for about six hours, as long as the tide is high until the water moves off from the trench. The CDC team also visited several areas around Wakenham where they interacted with affected residents. They then visited the island of Leguan and conducted a similar assessment. The team returned to the islands on Friday to complete their assessment and distribute hampers with cleaning supplies. Reporting from Wakenham with videographer Anil Sila, Anara Khan for InfoHub. Travel to the interior region will soon get a boost with the upgrade of the Lethem Airdrome, expected to begin soon. Anara Khan, who was in the Upper Takatu, Upper Essex River region, as part of a wider team for the ministerial outreach there, witnessed the historic agreement. The government of Guyana is committed to seeing the Lethem Aerodrome transform into a regional airport. This was expressed by the Minister of Public Infrastructure, the Honorable David Patterson, on Sunday morning during the ceremonial signing of the agreement for the rehabilitation of the aerodrome in Latham. The job was awarded to H. Knott and Sons Limited on September 20, 2019 for $137.3 million and has already been catered for in the 2019 budget. The government intervention on this aerodrome is a response to the primarily the tourism sector. And they've asked that if we improve the infrastructure countrywide, what we will have and what their commitment would be to be a cheaper uh, flights for Guyanese, ordinary Guyanese to be um, traversing here. Prime Minister, the Honorable Moses Nagamutu, was also present at the signing. He noted the project's importance to the region. This is one location that would become uh, a hub 
a regional hub and an international hub, as the minister has said. And we believe that uh, the investment is worthy and the project is of critical importance to this vast region bordering a vast subcontinent, actually Brazil. The project will see 4,000 feet of runway being upgraded, which forms phase one of the upgrades to meet IKO standards. Over the next five years, 12 Guyanese will benefit from a $782 million scholarship program aimed at boosting training and research. In less than a month, four PhD and eight master's students will journey to Trent University in Ontario, Canada to expand their knowledge in five disciplines. With funding from the Canadian oil and gas companies CGX and Frontier Energy Inc., the academics will become the central trainers that will transform Guyana into a robust, sustainable economy. Today at the launch of the program, Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Philanthropy, Alumni and Civic Engagement and Chair of the Transitional Management Committee, Dr. Paloma Mohammed, said a project will open new doors for the country's premier tertiary institution. It's going to pay for funding, it's going, to, it's going to pay for publications, it's going to pay for travel, it's going to pay for accommodation and for tuition for over five years. And the cost is about five million Canadian dollars. But a very important aspect of this, which is important to UG at this moment during our own transformational process, is that the CGX and Trent will also, as part of this agreement, lend important, well, non-reimbursable, technical support to the university in the areas of strengthening our financial systems. During the course of the five years, students will be exposed to training and research programs, including watershed ecosystems and water quality, sustainable food and agriculture, indigenous studies, natural products, materials, physics, and chemistry. Manager of Trent University's Office of Research Innovation, John Knight, described the collaboration as a strategic partnership with a purpose. This is actually a very exciting initiative that's taking place here. Two universities, one in Canada, one in Guyana, two different countries, um, a small university, Trent, like we're a small fish in a big sea, a large university, University of Guyana, the largest university in the country of Guyana. The areas of research and training target the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals relating to Ghana. Funding for the project will also allow for the development and funding of local research areas of national need for Ghana. It will also provide technical support in areas of critical transformation of the university here. Present at the event was Director of Energy Dr. Mark Bino, representatives of the Canadian High Commission, CGX officials, and Vice President of Operations and Development, Frontier Energy, and Trent University Professor Dr. Surish Narayan. Reporting for InfoHub, Alexis Rodney. As the curtains came down in Activities for Education Month, His Excellency President David Granger engaged thousands of students who participated in the Education Exposition 2019 at Durban Park. Citing the massive improvements in the education sector over the last four years, His Excellency President David Granger said that Guyana is well on its way to becoming an education nation. And we'd love to have more of you going into the teaching profession. So we create a virtual cycle. The better the teachers, the more teachers, the more students, and the better the students will be in years to come. I vow that from next year, we are going to reintroduce that entitlement so that every child in Guyana is entitled not only to free you primary, nursery, primary, and secondary education, but also if you're qualified, you're entitled to free tertiary education as well. Education Minister the Honorable Dr. Nicholas Henry explained that providing educational opportunities for all is paramount to the success of Guyana's children. Undoubtedly, education is the most important tool that symbolizes growth in any nation. Education lessens the challenges you will face in life. The more knowledge you gain, the more opportunities will open up to allow you to achieve better possibilities. 
The education exposition brought together thousands of students from 100 schools across Guyana. Chief Education Officer Dr. Marcel Hudson remarked that Guyana is becoming increasingly on par with international standards. Our progress as a nation can be no swifter than our progress in education. And the human mind is our fundamental resource. It is therefore necessary that we do everything in our power to protect and nurture this resource as we contemplate national development. The education exposition showcases various areas within STEAM such as science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, and exposes students to various areas of learning, training, and professional advancement. As the good life for all Guyanese continues, the exposition comes at the end of this year's Education Month 2019 themed Education, the Key to National Development. For Info Hub, Delicia Haynes. Heritage Month also wrapped up with celebrations at St. Cuthbert's Mission in Region 4, St. Ignatius in Region 5, and the staging of the Indigenous Heritage Pageant in Georgetown. On Saturday, His Excellency President David Granger joined in the heritage celebrations at St. Cuthbert's Mission Region 4. During his remarks, the President reiterated the vital role the village must play in restoring education within the region. Villages are the, one of the most important institutions in our country. Most Guyanese come from villages, and most Guyanese up to now still live in villages. We should honor and respect the role that villages have played in building our country. The same day, over in Region 9, Prime Minister the Honorable Moses Nagamutu celebrated with the residents of the South Rupununi at St. Ignatius Village. In his remarks, the Prime Minister noted that the community had much to celebrate. I received a message from Minister Cathy Hughes. She advised me that today they have installed the Ministry of Public Telecommunication has provided internet services to 24 communities in Region 9. So now you are online. So this is a very great achievement that you are not only celebrating Indigenous Peoples Month as a cultural event, you're also now connected to the world and the world is connected to you. And this is a tremendous advantage you have. Meanwhile, in Georgetown, 10 beauties took to the stage of the National Cultural Center, vying for the crown of Miss Indigenous Heritage Queen 2019. The Indigenous beauties impressed judges with their elaborate gowns, traditional outfits, and their talent pieces. But it was Esther Marslow of Region 1 that outshone the others and emerged the winner. <laughs> The first runner-up, Ms. Shauna Fredericks of Region 2, followed by second runner-up, Ms. Luana Alicock of Region 9. In the technology sector, GTT subscribers from Georgetown to Great Diamond, Lusignan and several in Burbies are the first to benefit from the 4G long-term evolution mobile network service. With GTT 4G LTE launch, customers can experience faster download and upload speed for their mobile device. Uh, faster downloads and upload speed for photos, videos, and their mobile application, higher definition of online gaming and videos, and this is specifically to our super tech savvy persons, and reliable connectivity that is constantly improving your mobile device while it's on the go and improve your application performance. That was GTT's product executive, Jamal Delph. Minister of Public Telecommunications, the Honorable Catherine Hughes, described the initiative as a red-letter day for Guyana's telecommunications sector. As the Minister responsible for telecommunications in Guyana, I applaud this development at a time when demand for high-speed data is peaking and will continue to peak with the transformation of our economy and as we move into an oil and gas industry on our doorstep. 
Minister Yu's said the government is currently entering its decade of development where connectivity and high-speed data availability will become a key driver in this regard. Chief Executive Officer Justin Ned noted the achievement of the company since its last upgrade to the mobile service. He added that persons not living within the current 4G LTE coverage areas can upgrade their SIMs to benefit from the service when they are within the coverage areas. As we bring LTE to the public, and, and we certainly look forward to rolling that out to more and more of, of Guyana as we get Spectrum, I would say I'm delighted to be here as the leader of GTT, bringing hundreds of thousands of people more advanced services. Kellen Rover for InfoHub. This has been InfoHub Recap, which looked at major stories carried during the week of September 28th to October 4th. Remember to subscribe to our website for more stories and follow us on our social media platforms. Have a safe and enjoyable weekend. Goodbye.